With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Welcome to the Exploring More podcast with Michael Thompson. I'm S.J. Jennings, and Michael and I, along with the rest of the team, are on the road on mission, going after more life, more love, and more freedom for the hearts of men and women, here in North Carolina and out in Colorado. So this week, we have an excerpt from one of our weekends for you to check out. We'll be back in the studio October 10th with the final two episodes of our Ingredients of Love series, Belonging and Significance. Until then, enjoy a taste of the environments we create for men and women, and we'll be back with you soon. Thanks for listening. Welcome. Welcome. I am so glad you all are here. My name is Robin Thompson, and we are thrilled that you are here. We have been planning this and praying for you all for months, and every time the registrations, a new registration came in, we were thrilled, and we've been praying for you by name. And the ones that I took notice of that really cracked me up are the ones that said the group name. You put This Is Us on the group name. (laughs) Where are my This Is Us girls? Love that. I love it. And... A few of you, I, I, it cracked me up because you put roommate requests on the forum and it was anyone from This Is Us. It just sounded funny and just, I loved it. But I want to affirm each one of you for making the effort to get here, for making the sacrifices that you made to get here. I know it was a lot. Many of you made financial, significant financial sacrifices. I know many of you went to great lengths to secure your home front, make sure if you have children to make sure kids are cared for, pets are cared for, all the things, and I get that. Some of you are even now battling and overcoming fear and anxiety, and I get that too. Some of you came by yourself, and I applaud you what courage it took for you to come by yourself, what it took for each one of you to be here in the seat. I applaud you, and I'm proud of you. We are proud of you, and we are really glad you're here. It wasn't easy, was it? Did it feel like something was set against your coming here? Maybe a multitude of things? Maybe a hurricane? (laughs) But something was set against your coming Steps we take towards life and freedom are opposed. We have an enemy that is literally hell-bent on stealing, killing, and destroying you, your life, your life in God. Some of our team has experienced this on a whole new level this week. And it, it really sucks. It really does. But God, but God. God is greater than our enemy, and he has good for us this weekend. Many of you are journeying through some really challenging things, and carving out the time and making this weekend a priority is not to be underestimated. Taking this time away for your heart is so good. It's so vital. So I'm so glad you did that. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. I want to share with you two reasons why I'm here this weekend. About 15 years ago, my husband encouraged me to come to a retreat similar to this one. Can any of you relate to that? Had husbands saying, you should go. Michael had recently attended a men's retreat that a weekend like this that changed his life. And he came back and he just kept sharing with me about how, what he experienced there and how God came for him and how life-changing it was for him. And he'd read me excerpts from his journal. And 
I'll never forget him saying to me, Robin, they have a women's weekend like this, and I bet you would love it. And I think you should go and get your heart back. (laughs) And my response was, my heart is just fine. Thank you very much. But I was open to considering a weekend away in the beauty of Colorado and letting him take care of our three daughters for four days. So I went. And oh my goodness. At that conference like this one, I heard them talking about a larger story that our story was in. They showed film clips that gave pictures to what they were trying to say. And I heard for the first time that the context of our lives was we were in a love story set in the midst of a fierce battle. And I heard that I was adored by the king of the universe, pursued by him, and simultaneously hated, despised, and hunted by an enemy who was hell-bent on destroying us and our intimacy with God and our intimacy with each other. Who knew? Not me. All of that was new to me. I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. And at that time in 2004, Michael and I were currently in ministry, and I thought I knew all there was to know about the Christian life. My heart is just fine. Thank you. It was Dan Allender who said, beginning with the first day of life outside the womb, one of the core questions every child is asking is, am I loved? This question marks us throughout life, and the answers we receive set the course for how we will live. In my head, I knew that Jesus loved me, and I knew he wanted a relationship with me. But I knew nothing of intimacy of conversational intimacy with him, that he just wanted to be with me. He wanted to talk with me, and he wanted to make his home with me. He wanted to partner with me. He wanted me to know above all else that I was his beloved daughter. I was seen, I was known, and I was dearly loved. That did something for me that weekend, and I will never be the same. Henry Nouwen said, being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. We are the beloved. We are intimately loved long before our parents, teachers, spouses, children, and friends loved or wounded us. That's the truth of our lives. That's the truth spoken by the voice of our God that says, you are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. So the first reason I'm here is because I want every single woman to know and experience being the beloved. I'll share my second reason in a few minutes, but first I want you to hear from some some women who are going to help guide us through this weekend, our guide team, women just like you and me. These happen to be some of my best friends women that I have the privilege of journeying through life with, this larger story with. We cry together. We laugh hard together. They are precious to me. We have found that there is a way to live in the kingdom, in the love of the Father, in his affection, in the authority that Jesus has accomplished for us and turned over to us, to live in freedom, to live with hope, and knowing there's always more. We're journeying, and it's new more for us that we're uncovering every morning, every day. Each one of them has some important things to share with us this weekend. So I want to invite Sherry to come up first. One of the things I love about Sherry, and there's many, is how she grows and cultivates beauty in her garden and shares it with me, like beautiful blue hydrangeas and tomatoes. But what I most love about Sherry is her heart. I love her heart for women, and I think almost all of you have experienced a little bit of Sherry's heart. But Sherry's heart longs for your hearts to experience what her heart has experienced. And I love that about Sherry. I met Sherry maybe almost 10 years ago at a deepening weekend. She came up to me after it was over, and she said, I brought a group of women here. 
and we want to take this back to our home, and we want to do this together. And I just saw her be a glimpse of her heart then, and still love her today, and love that she's with us, with Zoe. So, Sherry, share with us. Thank you, Robin. It's so good to see you all. I'm glad you made it. So, the heart. Robin mentioned the heart and getting her heart back. And I remember, gosh, 10 years ago, nine years ago, sitting in your seats. And Scott had come home from a weekend similar to the one Robin described for the men. And he shared with me this film, Braveheart, which I'm like, I don't know that I want to watch that. It's a lot of dudes. But then I saw Mel Gibson. I'm like, okay, I can watch this. (laughs) But in the beginning, there's this great exchange between the boy, William Wallace, and his father, Malcolm, in a dream. It occurs early in a story, shortly after William's father and older brother have gone to a summit of Scotsmen, at which most of them are brutally murdered by the evil and oppressing King Longshanks. And so when the surviving men returned, and the young boy's father was not among them because he had died in battle, that night, young William had a dream. He had a vision. And in this vision, he was lying next to his father, Malcolm, who turns to the young William and says, with all tenderness and conviction, your heart is free. Have the courage to follow it. So we're going to have lots of quotes this weekend. You might notice that. You don't need to hurriedly write them down. You can take a picture or we'll send them all to you after the weekend. So it was at that first deepening weekend in 2010. I remember my heart didn't feel free. (laughs) It had survived the rough waters of betrayal, of divorce, remarriage, building a new life in a new place. And I was feeling very managed by my schedule, by my desires, by my trying to do well in my new job. I was feeling crushed by the expectation of others. And I was just exhausted to prove myself trying to go staff at the church I was volunteering. And I remember sitting in that chair on that front row that weekend when I just, I thought I knew my heart, but I realized I never understood it. When Robin shared this quote, she said, our deep desire is to be loved unconditionally, to be seen, to be known for who we really are, to be valued, esteemed, desired, pursued, fought for, to be precious to someone, to be their beloved, the object of their affection. Our hearts are designed for this. By God. What? Wait, really? Are you, are you sure? Because, you know, I had come into that weekend believing that my heart was deceitfully wicked, that it was corrupted. I mean, everything that I had learned as a new Christian was, was completely challenged that weekend. After all, would Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, dwell in anything that is wicked, corrupt, deceitful, or heinous? Never. Never. So if he dwells in us, what does that tell us about our hearts and what we've learned about our hearts? I mean, the Bible does not say in Matthew 22, 37, love the Lord your God with all of your evil heart. Right? Or if you go to Psalm 13, 5, I trust in your unfailing love. My wicked heart rejoices in your salvation. And in 1 Peter 1.22, it doesn't say, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so you have sincere love for each other, love each other deeply from your corrupted heart. No, no, friends, you have a new heart because God gave you a new heart. Listen to Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and to live by my commands. You'll live once again in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. Why? Because your heart is central. Your heart matters. And I love that Robin shared the scripture Proverbs 4.23, because that tells us how our heart matters. Above all else, guard your heart, for from it everything flows. Everything. Not some things, not a few things, not a couple of things. Everything. That's a lot. That's everything. 
I'd say that makes your heart pretty important. Listen to this quote from John Eldridge in Waking the Dead. To find God, you must look with all your heart. To remain present to God, you must remain present to your heart. To hear his voice, you must listen with all of your heart. To love him, you must love with all of your heart. You cannot be the person God meant you to be. And you cannot live the life he meant you to live unless you live it from your heart. The enemy's plan from the beginning was to assault the heart, make women so busy they ignore their heart, wound them so deeply they don't want a heart, twist their theology so they despise the heart, take away their courage, destroy their creativity, make intimacy with God impossible for them. Ugh, my stars. Friends, the enemy fears us, and he fears what we will become. He does all he can to separate us from God, causing us to disregard, despise, or just plain undervalue our hearts. I know I did. So I keep coming back to the deepening weekend for my heart and for yours. I long for you to know God's heart and his desire for your heart. So I'm going to bring up Rebecca, my dear friend, who will talk to you about life. She embraces life, she invites life, and she nurtures life like no woman I have ever met. Our coffees together are incredibly life-giving. So my friends, here's Rebecca. Hi, y'all. I echo what everybody else has said. Great job getting here. It wasn't easy for me, so I know. I would love to hear them all, honestly, <laughs> I think. Okay, so the reason I'm here tonight, it has to do with a hunger that I have. And I just find that I have an insatiable hunger for more than what I've got. I've tasted something, but it's not enough. I want to know more. I, I'm not content with the experiences I've had with God or my understanding of him. I just, I want more. I want so much more. And I find that on days when I'm not recognizing it for what it is or when I'm operating from my false self, that drives me to check Instagram again or eat dark chocolate or look at my emails again. Just silly things. But I really, really want anything there is to have of God, I want it. And so I'm here, and I want it for you all, too. And in Ecclesiastes, I want to say to you that your, your longings are good. They're for a purpose, and this is the purpose. Ecclesiastes, in the Amplified Version, says, He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet men cannot find out, comprehend, or grasp what God has done, his overall plan from the beginning to the end. So God gave me all this longing on purpose to stir up life, which is the kingdom theme that I get to talk to you about for just a minute. You know that life is why Jesus came. It's because of his love, but he wants us to have life to the full, like abundant, good life. That doesn't mean it will always be an easy life, but he wants it to be an abundant life. John 10.10 10 says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. And I guess now would be a good time to say another reason why I'm here at this type of retreat is because sometimes I feel like this isn't the message we're told. We're not told that our hearts are good now and new now and that God has life for us. And it's a more, a different message we receive. And I, I bring that up because I particularly struggle with a past that was religious, I guess is the word that you would use. Good-hearted, kind-hearted people. But it's just a struggle that I have. So this message in particular, that God wants us to have life to the full. And all that that means is so um, beautiful to me. And I just want to say to each of you that Jesus is set on arranging vibrant life for each of us and restoring it where it's been lost. Because I know for myself, there were times that I didn't really recognize longing in myself. 
I didn't really have any longing because I think I was barely alive. My heart was numb. It was scarred over by, I guess it was just so many wounds, and it was just scarred. The whole surface of it just felt scarred. Gradually, he's been awakening me, and I'm so thankful. But I went through a time of betrayal. Sherry mentioned the same, and I think it's a story for a lot of you of husbands and how they hurt us. And I had been married for about 10 years with two little boys and found out my husband was cheating on me. And it was, I honestly had no clue that kind of pain existed. I I really didn't. I grew up in a pretty sheltered existence and I was loved and I just didn't know. I had no clue. And then the other thing I learned in time was that my own heart had been betraying me too because I spent all my time becoming something that I thought somebody else wanted rather than nurturing the life Hi, I'm sorry, I just saw one of my friends I hadn't seen yet. Um, anyway, sorry, I just had to do that. Um, anyway, anyway, actually, this is perfect because my friend Cheryl, best story ever, she and I met in Sunday school, both feeling so scarred and wounded for the exact same reason, having no clue that anybody else was experiencing what we were experiencing. It was one of those Sunday schools where they're like, okay, how was your summer? Tell us about it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable. And I was like, I got divorced. And she's like, me too. So anyway, this is perfect. But what I want to tell you is that God is intent on arranging life for us. And God has been restoring my life. And I know he will never stop. And the way he's done it is by experiencing him, like Robin was talking about. So many customized experiences of his love to me. Because you know he pursues us in the unique language of our own hearts. He really does. And I think one of our invitations to you all this weekend is no matter how hard things are for you right now, to just, we're just inviting you to hope as much as you can. Just, I know it's scary, but there is so much more. There's always more. It's what Jesus is about, arranging and restoring life. And so I'm going to invite up Dana, and this is perfect because friends are one of the best ways we keep our hearts awake and alive, good friends. And Dana is one of the best at this. My favorite things about Dana is she's incredibly curious. She's curious, she's witty and wise. She's really great at engaging and inviting beauty, especially around the dinner table. She can spread a delicious and beautiful meal, so... We tease her because we say that she has a bed and breakfast because everybody who knows it just keeps showing up at our door. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I'm from New York, but I like y'all. I like y'all. <laughs> I'm here this weekend, kind of like Robin. My husband went on one of these retreats, I don't know, how long ago? 2002. So do the math. And then he went with a group of guys that we are all in fellowship with, and they all decided that we should go. And he did it a little bit nicer. He didn't say, honey, I think you need to get your heart back. (laughs) But when I went to that weekend, what captured me were some of the words that you guys are using. Belovedness. Belovedness for me, I think what I always felt was, and what was told to me as a believer, was sinner first. I'm a sinner first. And so that speaks to your worth and to your worthiness. And, and then the heart, your heart is what Sherry shared, our heart being desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, okay, if I can't really know it, can I really know God? And so everything was in question. And when I went to this weekend and was told I am the beloved daughter, I am a lost treasure that Jesus came to redeem. I'm a treasure. And my heart is good. He's given us a heart that can know him. That was true of me before Christ, that I had a heart that couldn't know him, but now I have a heart. That changed everything. And I thought the timing was really good in hindsight because shortly after this weekend, we were all journeying together, but my family, we were about to enter into about eight to 10 years of hard things that just kind of piled on and a lot of treasure too. And I'm here now because I need to stay in, I want to stay in this message. The enemy in the world lies to us And I need to put myself in front of the truth. And these and others in this room have been really good truth tellers and pointing me to the right place when I need to be pointed in that direction. And I want to talk a little bit for a minute about kingdom. We're going to talk about kingdom this weekend. That Wonder Woman trailer that we saw, Steve and Diana, um, I love their little interchange. She says, what's your mission? And he says, 
to stop the war. And she says, what war? And he says, the war to end all wars. So that's, it's the kingdom of darkness that they are pushing back, these two warriors, and it's their mission to liberate captives and to free the oppressed. This is the kind of kingdom that Jesus brought. You know, as Christians, we use the word church a lot, and that's a good word. But Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, he spoke about kingdom. And actually, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is mentioned 119-ish times just in the Gospels. And I want to take you through a few scriptures about kingdom. In Matthew 13, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything to get enough money to buy it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great price, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Jesus is the man who discovered this treasure. He hid it, he buried it, and then he went and he he sold everything in order to purchase it. And I want to say that we, me, you, are that treasure. You are the pearl of great price that he came to redeem, that he came to restore us to, this kingdom. What else did Jesus say about the kingdom? He says in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this realm. In Luke 12, he says, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In Mark 4, he says, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. In Matthew 16, he says, I will give you the keys or the authority to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Luke 17, 21 says, The kingdom of God is within you, in your hearts, and among you, and surrounding you. Hebrews 12 talks about the type of kingdom that we're receiving, and it is an unshakable kingdom. We are the called out ones. It says the church, the word for church is ecclesia. It means the called out ones to whom it has been given to bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven to this earth. That's our job that that has been put in us in partnership with God and in community with one another. We bear the name, nature, and authority of King Jesus in us. And the culture of the kingdom, it sets captives free. It restores sight to the blind. This kingdom reclaims what was lost to the king and brings it home to him. And this kingdom offers beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. One way that I experienced the kingdom of heaven, my daughter, who's now 31, when she was 16, she ran away from home, and she was gone for three days. And we had an amazing group of friends, believing friends, and we reached out to them, and they formed posses, And the guys went and looked all over the city for her. We had people praying in different houses and people sitting with me by the phone and people bringing us food that we couldn't eat because we didn't know where she was. When we found her, one of our friends hopped in the car with my husband and drove three states away to go get her and bring her back. And she ended up having to spend the rest of her high school in a boarding school that was very expensive. But these people, they visited her, they They walked with us through all these years. They invested in her and in us. And my daughter will tell you that they literally saved her life. To this day, she is forever grateful to them. We live in a larger story than the one we often think we're living in. And Lee's going to come up in just a minute and tell us a little bit about that. But I would love for us to reclaim this word kingdom and bring this back into our vocabulary and our thinking and in our living It's something that we bring and offer now in this life. There's the already and the not yet. It's going to be fully restored to us one day, but we walk in it now. And before I bring Lee up, I want to say one thing about citizenship. In order to be a part of the kingdom, you need to become a citizen of the kingdom. Nicodemus in John 3 met with Jesus, and Jesus was talking to him about that it's necessary, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need to be born again. And he's, he, you know, we all know this, probably most of us know the scripture, hopefully all of us, but in other words, he says, you need to be born from above, born of the spirit. And I just want to invite anybody in this room who might have a question about their citizenship, that any one of our team, probably anyone that came with you, we would love to chat with you about that and help you, help usher you in 
So if you have any questions, don't leave without having that resolved. And I want to bring Lee up, our friend Lee. Lee is a woman to whom every bush is a burning bush. She hears Jesus singing to her through Elvis Presley on the radio. <laughs> and I've been on road trips with her, and we're talking about the things of God. And a billboard will pass us by, and it has a word from the Lord, honest to God, that she sees. And, she's, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. So that's what I love about her. And she is also a beautiful dancer. I'm a little nervous. You seem like nice people. <laughs> I was, that person that um, Robin was talking about with the anxiety and a little bit of fearfulness being here. So that's, I'm, that's me. So what brought me to this was in 1986, that's when I met my husband and I, I met Brent Curtis, who, if you've read The Sacred Romance, he co-wrote that with John Eldridge. And, and we were in a small group with Brent and his wife, and um, my husband brought him in to do a, a retreat with AIA, which is an athletic ministry and crusade that we were with. The first time that I learned about the heart was from him. And I learned, I didn't know that it had anything to do with the Christian life, the heart. I thought the Christian life was about duty and obligation and about mastering principles, as many as you can. And that the heart was wicked and avoid it at all costs. I got to go to many of Brent's courses when he taught in Colorado Springs, and, and I was one of his intercessors. He had a woman that was, her father was a satanic priest, and he, this was his baptism into warfare, and I was his intercessor, and he would call me that he would be meeting with her, and he actually, having no relation to this warfare idea, actually had the disembodied spirit of this woman's father come into the counseling session, and he even said to me, I can't tell you everything because you'll feel like you were dragged through hell. And he was just thrown into this thing. And, and then he was my counselor. And I had designed a passage for our children to take our children at a certain age from where they were walking in their faith because of us. And they came out from underneath and gave themselves to God. And we gave them to God. And I gave them, each of them, to God and to the company of men that we were with into a lost and dying world. And he came and spoke to my daughter words that were so stunningly beautiful for her passage. I will never forget. And he loved the idea so much that he was doing it with his son. And then he got summoned to the councils of heaven. And that night we went to his home as he went to his home. And we had to see his son's you know, just little, two little guys faced that, and our hearts were broken. And he was the first one to come and see us when we had our third, our son, Nick. And we said, we can't think of a middle name. And he said, Shane. And we said, that, okay, Nicholas Shane. And we should have said Nicholas Brent. I don't, we, we just weren't thinking, but we did that because of who he was. And, and he had everything to do with us finding this story. And then I got to go to a conference with Dr. Crabb, and actually Dr. Crabb, the revelation of a larger story was a revelation that God gave to Dr. Crabb, that there is a larger story going on. And, and he said that he, he had a whiteboard and he had cancer written on the top with the word small story because he had cancer. And then he had the word larger story at the bottom. And then he said that his mentor called him. And it was a man who is a great theologian and a president of a great college in his 80s, and it was his mentor, and he said, you know, everybody's saying, poor Larry, poor Larry, he has cancer, he has cancer. He said, no, commander in training. And so he wrote under small story, cancer, and under larger story, commander in training. And I thought that is such a powerful understanding of what the larger story is. Brandt was the one who wrote, he said, we reduce our lives to an endless series of chores and errands and a busyness that separates us from God. But Christianity is a love affair set in the midst of a life and death battle. And then we saw him step into that life and death battle. And I realized in that, just in these years that anything less than that is religion and it's soul killing. Anything less than a love affair set in the midst of a life and death battle. And I realized also that Christianity is not for the faint of heart and that we have a drop dead, gorgeous, exotic God. He is relentlessly pursuing our affection. 
and that all of us have a hidden destiny in this larger story. And Dr. Crabb says, there is a God, he's up to something wonderful, and it will take some time. The story that God is telling has no beginning. It's equal to his power and his majesty, and it's been hidden through the ages. And Satan has hidden it as well, and so well. Because I'm telling you, if every human being got a glimpse of the larger story that God is telling in the earth, they would run to him. And Brent taught me that all of the Hollywood movies that you see, all the stories, they all borrowed from the larger story that God is telling, that all their themes that they use, they have no, none of their own. They are, have borrowed and stolen them all from God. And then the crazy thing is they pretend to be living in this larger story that they're just acting out. I think that's kind of crazy. But the idea is that there's more going on here than you know. You're more than you know, and you know him by heart. And from creation to that happy, that famous happy ending, he reigns with wisdom, power, and love. And the story is so breathtaking that it has to come to us in a whisper through beauty and through affliction. And just one last thought, I would be, I was thinking of it and I thought it would be like a concert with Andre Bocelli singing and amplified, surrounded by a huge gospel choir with acrobats and dancers and musicians and fireworks and a light show surrounded by 360 degrees of the storm of all storms. An intoxicating fragrance is around you and the earth is slightly rumbling underneath your feet, and you're holding on to a baby black panther. <laughs> and I, I think I probably just described the sapphire throne, but it's just impossible to describe the magnitude of this story and of his kingdom. There is no end. And I want to just bring up a princess on the way to her throne, the glory in the kingdom that surpasses any glory, and you know, I'm not telling you anything, knew, is, is to have undistracted devotion and dove's eyes for the king. And just having met Ashley a little while, having had her pray and speak into my life and watch the things that she says at 25, the most beautiful dove's eyes and undistracted devotion. Wow. I really hope I live up to that because that is beautiful. <laughs> Guys, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so excited to be here. I'm an Enneagram 7, so everything is exciting. Sorry if you just hear a ton about the Enneagram. If you talk to me, I'm an avid, yeah, if you know me. But I keep coming back here. I keep bringing people here, inviting really my favorite aspect of this retreat and how we have it set up is we have time alone with God at the end of every session. And I believe that that is what sets this ministry apart. I believe that that's what sets us apart as women. We go directly to the throne and we go directly to the voice of God and we want to hear from God and we want y'all to hear from God. And I want to say that God speaks and he wants to speak to you. And he has things, especially this weekend, that he is so excited to tell you about each and every one of you, about your life. Experiencing and hearing this voice of God is completely changing my life. Hearing his voice directly in my being, the Holy Spirit in me, rising thoughts to my head. I mean, it's, it's really changing and transforming me by the renewing of your mind. How this has looked in my life, I graduated college and like a really good millennial, I moved back home. And I was really honestly having a bit of an identity crisis of realizing for so long, you know, you go school, 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 and then I get to choose what's next. What do I like? Who am I? What am I good at? What? And deeper than even that, it was, God, I don't feel like I know who I am right now. I don't feel... Like, I really have a grasp on my identity. And for so long, I was really editing of, you tell me who I need to be, and I'll be that for you to want me. You tell me what you like, and I'll be that for you to like me. That along the way, I really started to lose the essence of my true self. 
And so graduating college, moving back home, I started going to yoga more regularly. And after sweating a lot in hot yoga, there's this like really amazing best part, honestly, where you just lay there. And in our studio, they give you a massage and everything. And so you're just excited. But I chose to be a little bit more in tune with things that mattered. And I'm laying on my mat and just started asking Jesus, Jesus, I know even in scripture, and it's good who you say I am, but like Rebecca said, I need more. I need to know exactly me, how you see me, that it is going to matter and it's going to have weight in my life if and when you tell me. And I had friends who were experiencing the voice of God and I was seeing how it was changing their lives and I wanted that. You know, when you see something in someone, you're like, they have something and that's real. I want that. So I would lay there and say, Jesus, some of, I think y'all know this. I might've shared it last, uh, two years ago, but Jesus, how do you see me? I need to know from you, how do you see me? And I would pause and I would trust that whatever would then come to my head was Jesus because he, he's in us and he speaks through our imagination, through billboards, through songs, through a hundred different ways, but he really speaks within us. He lives inside us. And so I would trust that my thought was him and he would just drop a word and sometimes I wouldn't know the word. <laughs> and so, for example, one of the, the times was tenacious. And I'm brilliant, but that was a tough one. And so I would write it down and go back home and really Google it and look it up. And that happened so many times. And even if I knew the word, I wanted the full essence of it. And just hold it to my heart and was like, I want this to be true about me. I'm believing that was you. I believe that that was you who put that thought in my head and just started collecting it and really believing more and more. And I believe that that's what he wants to do with us this weekend in our time alone with God. And it's a practice. We begin to discern more and more. What was that you, Jesus? I believe that that was you. And even just preparing this time, I was asking Jesus Jesus, what do you want to say to these women? What do you want them to know about your voice? And I, and I sensed, I want them to know that I am real. I want them to know that I am good. And I want them to know how much I love them. So I bet that that is coming for y'all. And as we talk about hearing God, we also need to talk about there are things that are in the way of hearing God. Just like there's things in the way y'all know of experiencing intimacy with him and receiving his love, there are things in the way that we believe and we call these deep-seated beliefs, we call them agreements. And I'm gonna put them up if they're not already up, but I'm, I'm doing about five examples. There's a ton of agreements, but these beliefs, I don't wanna fall off the stage, that'd be embarrassing. These beliefs, if we still have them in operation, can really get in the way of hearing from God. So, for example, if you believe that God doesn't speak, you're probably not going to hear much from him. I'm going to let you all read a couple of these all the way down to not trusting him. It's really hard to receive from someone you don't trust. Do you all have any of these? Yeah, me too, for sure. You all can raise your hand. You don't have to. I love participation. I've had these, I've had to break all of these at some point, sometimes three times, sometimes more. And because I don't want anything in the way from receiving and hearing the voice of God and receiving what he has for me. So I'm gonna leave these up here and what I'm gonna lead us in, and then Robin's gonna come back up, but what I'm gonna lead us in is we wanna formally unsubscribe from these beliefs and we call that breaking agreements. And so just in your seat, you can even ask Jesus if you're comfortable with that, if you feel like there's something else that you just know is in the way. But I want, if one of these or a couple of them resonate with you, just sitting with it for a couple minutes and just telling Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to risk 
that this is a lie and that this is not what's true. And I'm sorry that I believe this. It's not an, I'm so sorry. I like hit myself, shame, sorry. But like, I don't wanna believe this. I'm sorry that I believe something that wasn't true. I break this in Jesus name and I, I want what's true, Jesus. I want you to speak. So we're just gonna do that for a couple minutes and then Robin's gonna come right back up. I know that's not enough time. We have dinner in 10 minutes. So I want to encourage you to continue doing this. Take a picture of the slide, maybe, and continue throughout the weekend, especially as any of these bubble up or come up in your mind. If you think one of these thoughts, that's a great time to say, I break that agreement. Jesus, tell me what's true. Thank you for that, Ash. The second reason that I'm here this weekend is because I want every one of us to encounter Jesus in a new way. I love this quote from Beautiful Outlaw. Jesus came to reveal God to us. He is the defining word on God, on what the heart of God is truly like, on what God is up to in the world, and what God is up to in your life. An intimate encounter with Jesus is the most transformational experience of human existence. To know him as he is, is to come home. To have his life, joy, love, and presence cannot be compared. A true knowledge of Jesus is our greatest need and our greatest happiness. To be mistaken about him is the saddest mistake of all. That weekend that I shared with you about in Colorado, they were talking about a Jesus that I did not know, at least not like that. A fierce and mighty warrior. Picture Braveheart. Mel Gibson, like Sherry, so wonderfully invited us to picture Mel Gibson. <laughs> but also, so this fierce and mighty warrior, but yet tender and compassionate and kind. Picture the little princess. They showed um, some scenes from the little princess and her father, she was a beloved daughter, and her father looking in her eyes and in her face saying, to her face saying, I know you by heart that kind of belovedness. That weekend I was introduced to the king of heaven and earth who was moving mountains to get to me, to capture my heart, to woo me to himself. And he is, and he has been my whole life. Who knew? Not me, I did not know that. I heard a quote that undid me from the sacred romance. We keep talking about the sacred romance and Brent Curtis, but it is just that good. We are the ones to be called, fought over, captured, rescued, and pursued. It seems remarkable, incredible, and too good to be true. There really is something desirable within me, within you. Something the king of the universe has moved heaven and earth to get. I'm precious to him. You are precious to him. I'm the object of his desire and his affection as are you. God's intimate affection is for me and you. I heard Zephaniah 317 in a totally new way. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Did you know the Hebrew word rejoice means to spin around under violent emotion? The phrase rejoice over you literally means to dance, skip, leap, and spin in joy. So the latter part of this verse is more accurately translated. He will dance over you with singing. And I love the vis visualization that comes to my mind thinking of God as this mighty warrior dancing over me with shouts of joy. How great is that? I love that. I want that. I want to picture him that way. Belovedness is more amazing when you know the one who's loving you. It's everything. It's foundational. And it's where it all begins. And we can't move forward until we get that. Love is the point. So that's why I'm here. Because I encountered a love like no other. And it changed me forever. And I want that for each one of us. And I want more. I want more of that. 
So I'm going to bring Sherry back up, and she's going to pray over us and dismiss us to dinner. So let me pray. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. You are so good to us. You see your beloved. We are not hidden from your sight, even though we feel so hidden away in this beautiful place of Windy Gap, just completely enveloped in the beauty that is Windy Gap, that you've created, that you've set aside sunny skies and warm weather for us um, in the midst of a hurricane, just part of the state away from us. So thank you for the way that you hold us and you see us and you love us. Um, And we thank you for everything that you're going to do this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey listeners, SJ here with a quick message about the audio session you're listening to. It's an excerpt from one of our weekend encounters with God. And if you love with your hearing and want to hear more, visit zoe.org forward slash store and pre-order the digital audio passes from either the 2019 Deepening Weekend for Women or the 2019 Heart of a Warrior Encounter West for Men. You'll receive audio recordings of all the sessions and get a glimpse into all that God does at our Weekend Encounters for the Heart. Visit zoe.org forward slash store, click on audio, and you'll find both pre-order options there. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on YouVersion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more.